In 2015, 28-year-old Mark Van Dongen, a Dutch national, was in a relationship with Belina Wallace, a woman almost 20 years his senior. During their five-year relationship, Mark had been abused emotionally, physically and financially by Wallace and was trying to escape from her control. Wallace would not have this and in the early hours of September the 23rd, 2015, she poured concentrated sulfuric acid over him when he was in bed, causing truly horrific injuries and intense pain as his skin melted. Mark survived this attack but eventually died in truly tragic circumstances. This woman is truly a monster and her behaviour and the legal proceedings will sicken you. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Belina Makadalidi Wallace was born in around 1969 in the township of Sebokeng in South Africa. Little is known about her upbringing, but at some point she contracted HIV, which she later claimed was due to being gang raped by men with this condition. However, what is documented is that in 1994, at age 25, she moved to the UK with her partner at the time, Ray Wallace, a UK national, and they stayed together for a number of years before separating sometime in the early 2000s. Mark Van Dongen was born in June 1987 in Holland and came to the UK in 2010 to study civil engineering at the University of Bristol. By this point, he had unfortunately contracted HIV, apparently from a short-term relationship with a woman from The Hague, a city in the Netherlands. Again in 2010, both Mark and Wallace were looking for relationships and were using a dating app for people who had HIV. This is how they met. At this point, Wallace was around 42 years old, whilst Mark was approximately 24. The relationship was abusive almost from day one, with Wallace verbally abusing Mark and quickly escalating to use of serious violence. On October the 10th, 2011, she poured a kettle of boiling hot water over him. Not wishing to get her into trouble, Mark sought medical attention, but claimed that he'd done it to himself by accident. The pair quickly moved in together into a property in Westbury Park in Bristol, and it was here, behind closed doors, that Wallace clearly thought she could get away with anything she wanted. She would frequently fly into a rage whenever Mark did anything to defy her. Whilst Mark found work as an engineer, Wallace was lazy, had no job, I was enrolled at the University of West England, based in Bristol. I was meant to be studying fashion on a part-time basis, but she hardly ever showed up to any of her classes. Instead, she took Mark's wages, which were around £300 a day, and used this to fund her lifestyle, as well as sending money back to her family in South Africa. In order to lock Mark in, Wallace took his passport, and whenever he threatened to leave her, or did for any period of time, she would emotionally manipulate and threaten him using a variety of tactics. She would scratch herself and give herself black eyes and say she would call the police and say that Mark had done this and he would lose his job and be kicked out of the country. She would also make threats of suicide, saying she would kill herself if he left her. Most concerningly, these threats to kill herself evolved to her making threats to kill him and then herself. Wallace also made claims that she was pregnant on several occasions to draw Mark back in. However, she would suffer a quote-unquote miscarriage to explain why she did not show signs of the pregnancy. Mark, unfortunately, appears to have been a somewhat naive but loving man. He seems to have been terrified of Wallace, but also extremely concerned that she would in fact harm or kill herself if he left her. So he suffered the abuse for four or five years, being financially, emotionally and physically abused by Belina Wallace during this entire time. Mark would often show injuries to his co-workers where he'd been attacked, and he was described as having, quote, gashes on his torso and neck areas. Where these were inflicted with a weapon is unclear, but likely. Despite working a very good job and having a bright future, he was miserable, and his personality and drive was being drained from him by Belina Wallace. He told his father, Keese, that he was afraid of Wallace. However, no one truly saw the danger Mark was in. He was caught in the web of a narcissistic, sadistic, and invariably psychopathic woman who believed she owned and controlled him. If he tried to escape, she would make him pay dearly. In mid-2015, Mark finally had enough of Wallace and tried to leave her permanently. He was, by this point, 28 years old, a successful engineer, and she was 48 years old, an unemployed perpetual student who added nothing to his life. In fact, all she did was take. 
in July 2015, Mark began looking for other partners online and met a woman called Violet. On the 15th of August 2015, the pair met for coffee and within three days had a second date where they went to the cinema. Mark explained his situation to Violet and showed the various scars he'd had from years of attacks. After being attacked by Wallace again, Mark moved into a hotel before moving into Violet's flat. Wallace threw every tactic she had to try and regain control over Mark. She found Violet's phone number and began making silent calls to her, clearly to intimidate her and to get her to back off. She also overtly threatened Mark, saying she would kill him and then herself if he did not return. On August 21st, 2015, Wallace told Mark she'd taken an overdose. Mark called 999 and reported this. This was a lie. She also claimed her ex-husband had had a heart attack and she was struggling to cope and needed someone there to support her. Another lie. On August 29th, 2015, she told a counsellor at the university that due to Mark leaving her, she felt, quote, depressed, angry, betrayed and anxious. It seems as though Mark, feeling guilty, did go back to the old flat and speak with Wallace and on several occasions he told Violet they could not be together but then he would find his resolve and come back to her flat. It was at this point Mark did something it appears he'd not done before. He called the police and reported Wallace for harassing him and Violet and she was spoken to by them. The police and Mark told Wallace that the relationship was over and she needed to stay away from him although she was only given advice by the police not formally arrested. However, Mark still seemed to feel sorry for Wallace and agreed to continue to pay the rent on the property which he'd done for the entire time they lived there which was £1,000 a month and he also agreed to give her around £750 a month to live off. Despite this, Wallace clearly spiralled into a murderous rage. How dare Mark not suffer her abuse? What right did he have to be happy in his life when clearly she was miserable? How dare he call the police on her? At this point, Wallace was losing control of Mark and he needed to be punished as she began planning her revenge against this man who had done nothing wrong that tried to be happy and move on with his life. Belina Wallace's preparation for the attack was shown by her internet history beginning on September the 2nd, 2015 when she ordered a litre of 98% concentrated sulfuric acid from Amazon she also spent her time googling the effects of acid on the human body, including what would happen if someone drank it. She also looked at autopsy photos of people who had ingested acid. Also, importantly, she began reading news articles about a case at the time where a man had apparently tried to get his girlfriend to drink acid from a glass by pretending it was water. She had also looked up guidance on how to get an ex-boyfriend back, what to do and say to reconcile. Clearly, she would not bought the acid to threaten, but to use it, and she was looking up not only the effect it would have on another human being, but also potential defences she could use after she had done this. On September the 22nd, 2015, Mark was contacted by Wallace, who was apparently crying down the phone, saying there was nothing for her in the UK, and she wanted to go back to South Africa, but she didn't have enough money for the plane fare. Mark went round to the property at around 10pm, as he felt sorry for Wallace, I was concerned about her demeanour. When he was there, she made further statements of suicide, so he said that he would stay the night. A tragic mistake. Whilst Mark was asleep, dressed only in boxer shorts, Wallace was busy putting her plans into place. She poured the acid into a beaker, and at 2.06am on the 23rd of September 2015, she called an ex-boyfriend of hers called Charles. At 2.40am, she woke Mark up, and said the following, quote, If I can't have you, no one else can. Before throwing the acid, primarily straight into Mark's face, but it covered most of his body, as shown by this map of his injuries. Remember, this was directly onto his skin, as he was only wearing boxer shorts. Mark thought, for a split second, that he'd been doused in water, but within seconds, he was in extreme pain, as his flesh began to melt. This clip gives you an idea of what concentrated sulfuric acid does to human flesh. You ready? Concentrated sulfuric acid onto skin.
you get a vigorous reaction between the concentration of sulfur sulfuric acid and the water in your skin and also the fats which is why as you can see it instantly becomes carbonized and as you can see that is in seconds what would happen to you if you spilt concentrated sulfuric acid upon your skin and that Mark ran blindly into the street screaming in pain and shouting for help a neighbor Dr Nick White recalled the instance in court with her stating quote I was woken by the sound of somebody shouting help me somebody help me please I looked out of the window and there was a guy standing there in his boxer shorts and he looked a really odd colour from his head down to his shoulders. My doorbell rang a few times and I knew there was something desperate going on and it was him. He looked like he was covered in a clay sort of mud which I later realised was his skin melting. The following harrowing 999 call was made. Whilst it's a short clip you can clearly hear Mark in the background in pain trying to process what had just happened to him. What's, what's happening, please? Somebody threw acid on something over his face. Somebody threw acid over his face, apparently. Did acid thrown over his face? Yeah. yeah. Okay, bear me a second. After the event, Dr. White's doorbell showed the corrosive effects of the acid, which was burning Mark's fingers whilst he desperately tried to get help. Dr. White and another neighbour took Mark to a flat and doused him in water in the bathroom, but it was clear he'd already suffered catastrophic injuries with his top layers of skin having been melted. The police and paramedics arrived quickly, and Mark was taken, screaming in pain, into an ambulance. He said he couldn't see, and asked if he still had eyelids. One of the police officers at the scene checked, and said, quote, Mr Van Dongen's eyes had turned grey. The irises had essentially dissolved. Police went into Wallace's flat, the site of the attack, and found her calmly sat on the sofa, coldly saying that Mark had been harmed with acid. She later claimed that she tried to get Mark into the bathroom to douse him with water, but phone records showed that immediately after the attack, she had again called her ex-boyfriend Charles. What she said to him before and after the attack has never been disclosed. She never called an ambulance. Wallace was arrested and the police recovered evidence and took photographs of the scene of the attack. These pictures show where Mark was laying when the acid was thrown on him and the burning to the bedding surrounding where he was attacked. The police also recovered the bottle of sulfuric acid and beakers, one of which was likely used to throw this over Mark. Before turning to the horrific injuries Mark suffered and what happened to him, I first want to focus on the lies told by the monster Belina Wallace in her police interview. Belina Wallace was taken into police custody and interviewed. This sick, twisted woman had already come up with her defence. She would blame everything on Mark. Rather than a man who suffered her abuse for the last five years, she said he was the violent one, who threatened to kill her and that he had poured the glass of acid and then tried to get her to drink it by telling her to take some pills and handing it to her as though it was water. She then, for some unknown reason, decided to throw the contents of the glass at Mark and then, realising it was not water, apparently tried to help Mark get into the bathroom to douse him with water. However, Mark had run out of the house. This is a short excerpt of the interview with Wallace, where she spews her lies. And Mark would have been the only person that would have, that could have put the acid in that glass. Yeah, he did, you know, because he said to me it was water. I've got water for you, right. you know, like you come and take your medication and go to bed. He wanted to me to, to burn my insides. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, yeah, it would have been awful, yeah, awful, yeah. No, it's not. You know, it's just like this man betrayed me. When he said, when he told you it was acid, what else did he say, if anything? Did he, you know, it, obviously I wasn't there, but I can imagine his reaction would have been somewhat alarming, perhaps. Yeah, he said, you've put acid at me. Yeah. You know, like, you know, that's when, you know, and then, um, you know, I just, you know, I just realized it was, you okay. know, like, and like a smelly and, you know, like in a house and then, see, and he was saying, oh, it hurts, it hurts, you know, and then, you know, like, that's when I was, wanted to help him. And I appreciate, I probably know the answer to this, but I will ask you anyway. Why didn't you call the ambulance? 
you know, I was just like um, confused and about loads of loads of things. Like uh, I was confused. The police did not believe Wallace. She was charged with throwing a corrosive substance with intent to cause grievous bodily harm and was remanded into custody to await her day in court. After the attack, Mark Van Dongen was taken to Southmead Hospital in Bristol. On the trip in the ambulance, he was screaming in pain all the way. Paramedics tried to manage Mark's pain, but his skin had essentially dissolved over much of his body, exposing his nerve endings, leaving this man in pain that I don't think it's possible to imagine. When he got to the hospital, Mark caught sight of himself in the mirror and screamed, quote, Kill me now. If my face is left looking like this, I don't want to live. It took several weeks to track down Mark's family, and when his father Keith van Dongen was notified, he travelled from his home in Belgium, driving as quickly as he could to be by his son's bedside. What he saw shocked him. He said, quote, We entered the ward. There were six rooms, one next to another. We looked in every room, and we looked at every person in the bed. At first, I said there's been a mistake. Mark is not here. He was in the first room I looked in. I failed to recognise my own son. His injuries were unbelievable. Mark was placed in a coma. He received burns to 25% of his body, and this skin had to be removed surgically. He'd also lost sight in his right eye, and he only had partial sight in his left eye. Mark's face had been completely destroyed. The flesh from his face had been completely melted, and he was unrecognisable. Mark was in a coma for four months, and during this time, his left leg had to be amputated. Key stayed by his son's bedside, morning, noon and night, talking to him, and telling him that someone who loved him was there by his side. When Mark woke up, he could only move his mouth and tongue, and initially communicated by sticking his tongue out when his father pointed to letters on an alphabet board. Mark eventually regained the power of speech, but due to the injuries to his face, neck and body, this was painful. Also, due to the effect the acid had had on his nervous system, he was paralysed from the neck down, and doctors said that he would be like this for the rest of his life. By November 2016, Mark was able to leave, but due to being assessed as needing, quote, a lifetime of constant and dedicated care, he was only able to move to a supported living accommodation, with a placement being found for him in Gloucester, with him having to live in these places for the rest of his life. Keys asked his son if he wanted help with organising the transfer to the care home, but Mark said he wanted to do it himself because he wanted to maintain his independence, so Keys returned to Belgium. The day after he was admitted to the care home, Mark called his father crying and screaming in pain, begging him to come and get him. Keys drove through the night from Belgium and arrived at the care home in the early hours of the morning. When he got out of the car, he heard horrific high-pitched screaming and began banging on the door over and over again until someone opened it. When he went in, he found his son covered in his own excrement and absolutely distraught. Keys cleaned up his son, who begged to go with him to Belgium. Keys said that he would sort something out. Keys organised a private ambulance and took Mark back to Belgium. He didn't tell anyone, but honestly, he was doing what was best for his son and I would have done the same thing. Keys offered to take care of his son at his home, but he said, quote, Dad, that would just be another ceiling to look at. For the next few months, Keys had to see his son in unbearable pain. Due to the damage to his nerves, Mark would have periods of extreme pain, but then also sensations of irritation, which, even when scratched, would not stop. Keys had to watch his son fall into depression. In late 2016, Mark developed a chest infection, and, due to the damage that the acid had had to his lungs, they were filling with fluid. Doctors told him a tube needed to be inserted into his throat, to remove liquid, which would almost certainly have meant he lost his voice permanently, so he would have no way to communicate with his father. Mark decided he couldn't live like this. He had gone from a six foot five fit and healthy young man to someone who was in constant pain, was almost blind, paralysed from the neck down, and had no hope of recovery. In fact, as his condition worsened, it's likely that Mark's situation would have become even more horrific. I cannot imagine the horror and fear felt by Mark. 
and the bravery of him to keep going for as long as he did. But he was tired and wanted to be at peace, and so he applied to a clinic in Belgium to end his life by euthanasia. Keys obviously didn't want his son to die and tried to talk him out of it, but he said, quote, Dad, I'm tired of fighting. I've suffered so much pain and I can't take any more. Please, let me go. He was assessed by three consultant psychiatrists who confirmed that this was, in their terms, a case of, quote, unbearable physical and psychological suffering and that Mark was a sound mind and was able to make an informed decision as to when his life should come to an end. For the last few weeks of his life, Keith spent every second with his son, knowing that their time together was short. Keith said that his son was brave and resolute in what he wanted. Mark chose the 2nd of January 2017 as the day he wanted to die, and spent his final hours with his father. When asked whether he wanted Keith there with him as he passed away, he said, quote, he said, quote, I want my dad to accompany me on my last journey. Keith then said, quote, at 7.15 p.m., doctors checked he was absolutely sure and all the laws had been followed. A doctor came in, then inserted a catheter into his heart. That was the end of my son. Mark Van Dongen passed away at the age of just 29 after suffering 15 months of pain and hopelessness. I hope he's free from pain and at peace. Due to Mark's death, Belina Wallace was charged with his murder. In addition to throwing a corrosive substance with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, she pleaded not guilty to these offences and went on trial at Bristol Crown Court in May 2018. Keith Van Dongen who had to watch his son in indescribable pain and then die, attended the trial. She stuck to her story that Mark was the one who had been threatening to kill her and had tried to get her to drink acid, which she had then thrown over him, believing it was water. She cried in the dock, clearly part of her pantomime, pretending she had remorse or any sort of compassion for anyone else but herself. And why would Mark want to kill her? Apparently she'd found out that he worked as a male prostitute in Holland and he was scared that she'd reveal his secret. All lies. Wallace's claims quickly fell apart, and despite feeling, quote, so sad about Mark's injuries, she could not explain why she'd not called an ambulance straight away, and instead called an ex-boyfriend. It was pointed out to Wallace that she was the one who bought the acid, and was looking up injuries which his substance could cause. Wallace claimed that yes, she'd bought the acid, but this was to treat fabric, and the only reason she'd looked up about its effects was because Mark had threatened to use it on her and she wanted to see what sort of injury she might get as a result of this. So, you're worried that your former partner is going to attack you with acid, so you buy some acid and keep it lying around the house. If you're worried your boyfriend was going to shoot you, would you buy a gun and leave it lying around with a big bow on it? Funnily enough, despite stating that Mark had poured the acid, his fingerprints were found nowhere on the container or the cup it was thrown from. The only fingerprints belonged to Belina Wallace. Of course, the jury found her guilty and she was convicted on the 17th of May 2018. But unfortunately, this was only for throwing the acid on Mark and not his murder. This is a decision I do not agree with. Basically, in the UK, if someone dies as a direct result of an attack, even years later, the offender can be charged with their murder. If Mark had died as a direct result of the attack, then Belina Wallace would have likely have been convicted of murder. But, because he took his own life, she was not deemed to be responsible in law, even though the reason why he did this was because of her actions. I hate this logic. I firmly believe that if someone takes their life as a result of suffering horrific injuries, which means they cannot bear to live anymore in intolerable pain, physically or psychologically, the monster who caused this should be held accountable for their death. However, the law in the UK does not agree. But, if Belina Wallace believed the court would go easy on her because she'd not been convicted of murder, she was mistaken. On the 23rd of May 2018, she stood to be sentenced at Bristol Crown Court before Mrs Justice Nicola Davies. 
Justice Davis stated that Wallace's actions were, quote, sadistic, as well as stating, quote, you chose your moment for the attack. It occurred when Mark Van Dongen, wearing only boxer shorts, was asleep in the bed, which you shared in your flat. Vulnerable, almost naked, he awoke but had no real opportunity to avoid the focus of your acid attack, namely his face and then his body. Immediately before you threw the acid, you said to Mark, If I can't have you, no one can. Your intention was to burn, disfigure and disable Mark Van Dongen, so that he would not be attractive to any other woman. It was an act of pure evil. She identified Wallace as a quote, manipulative and controlling woman. She then sentenced her. For throwing acid on Mark Van Dongen, Belina Wallace was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 12 years, i.e. she must serve at least 12 years in prison and can only be released once the parole board deem her no longer a danger to society, but, even when released, she will be supervised for the rest of her life. Keith Van Dongen was outraged by the sentence. He believed that Wallace should have been locked up for the remainder of her life. In his victim impact statement that he read out in court, Keith said, quote, I feel like a broken man, completely drained, and the old Keith no longer exists. Mark and I lost our battle. In the past, nothing would faze me, but now I've led in my shoes. Unfortunately, use of acid as a weapon has increased dramatically in recent years, especially in the UK. The death of Mark Van Dongen led to a change in the law, reducing the strength of sulfuric acid that someone could obtain online. Why this has not already happened, I do not know. Why an average Joe would ever need 98% concentrated sulfuric acid is beyond me. Now, you cannot buy anything above 15% concentration without a license. However, there are plenty of domestic cleaning products, such as drain cleaner, which can cause horrific injuries. Within a domestic context, acid is used by perpetrators to cause disfigurement to their victims, rendering them, in their mind, unattractive, and therefore they will never find another relationship. Also, them looking in the mirror and seeing their injuries will act as a constant reminder of the power that their abuser will always have over them. I'm going to do more cases where acid is used as a weapon, but probably the most famous case in the UK is that of Katie Piper. In 2008, Katie, an aspiring model, met a man called Daniel Lynch. Within two weeks of the relationship starting, he had raped and stabbed her. Lynch then tried to manipulate Katie, telling her he was sorry and would never do it again. Katie was having none of it. On the 31st of March 2008, Katie was lured to a cafe in Golders Green in London, where a friend of Lynch's, a man called Stefan Silvestri, approached Katie and threw sulfuric acid in her face. Her injuries were horrific, and it's clear the intent was to scar her, effectively ending her modelling career and making her unattractive to other men. Both men were jailed for life. However, Katie Piper is now a well-known and beloved celebrity, is married and has two children, She's clearly an awesome lady, and this is the ultimate fuck you to these two pricks. However, acid has also become a common weapon in gang attacks. Unfortunately, criminals being criminals, they'll always find a way to get around changes to the law. So, when the government cracked down on gun and knife possession, the weapon of choice became acid, something that could be carried in a plain bottle, thrown into someone's face, taken them by surprise, and easily disposed of. Hopefully you never come across someone who's been the victim of an acid attack. But, what do you do in this situation? This short clip tells you, so watch it and retain the information. You never know when you might be able to save someone from the horror that Katie Piper and Mark Van Dongen had to go through. Acid is thrown on someone. You have to think very quickly, how am I going to dilute this? So you've got to really um, improvise, use people around you and to try and get water to that area as quickly as possible. Where is it hurting your eyes? I've got a Is it hurting your eyes?
I recently covered the case of Catherine Knight, an Australian woman who in the year 2000 murdered and butchered her partner John Price. The parallels between Berlina Wallace and Knight are clear. Both women showed a high level of sexual jealousy and sought to control their victims through a variety of methods, including violence, threats of violence and emotional manipulation. Both women showed sadistic levels of violence and their ultimate aims were to punish the men who they believed had abandoned them, with them believing they should be able to treat them any way they wanted and they should always come crawling back. Underpinning both of their crimes was this horrific contradiction where they both were dependent on relationships with men but fundamentally hated them due to their backgrounds. So, when they abused them, they were not only trying to control their partners but also punish them for being male, using them as a way to vent their anger due to their own experiences of abuse at the hands of men in the past. With Knight, she had a traumatic childhood characterised by sexual abuse. With Wallace, she claims to have been gang raped when she lived in South Africa. The judge was cautious when believing this, as Wallace was clearly a pathological liar, a woman who wants to portray herself as a victim. However, there may be truth in what she said, not necessarily this particular instance, but I think, if you looked into her background, there was likely an incident, or several incidents, which led her to develop a hatred of men. To be clear, whilst I highlight the profile of offenders, I'm not excusing their behaviour. A troubled childhood does not give you the right to victimise others. I think Wallace was a woman who was so self-absorbed and narcissistic that she believed the world owed her a living. In her forties, she was the perpetual student, a bit like the guy you meet down the pub, who's middle-aged, but he keeps telling you his band's just about to make it. She leached off others, and, when she met Mark Van Dongen, she saw a way to fill the empty void inside of her, but also a way to continue to take no responsibility for her own life. He was her meal ticket. She abused this poor man for five years, with him being ground down to a mere shell of the man he was. However, Mark wanted more from his life. He wants a life free from abuse, and broke away from Wallace. Of course, she could not handle this. She could not deal with the idea of being alone, and how dare another man do this to her. In her mind, she could do no wrong. The relationship had not broken down because she was a monster. It was all Mark's fault. So, he deserved to be punished. Wallace used acid to scar Mark, so that no one would ever want him. She would forever be in control of him, and every time he looked in the mirror, he would be reminded of her. I've no doubt that Wallace looked at pictures of people who had been the victims of acid attacks and was getting a great sense of excitement from imagining Mark's skin melting and him screaming. Taking pleasure from someone else's pain is classic sadistic behaviour and I've no doubt that Wallace is a sadistic psychopath. She calmly put her plan into action and showed no remorse or empathy after this incident. Wallace, in my opinion, will always be a danger to anyone who crosses her, especially men she's in a relationship with. She was sentenced to a minimum of 12 years in prison, but taking into account remand time before she was sentenced, she will likely be eligible for parole in 2024. The decision about whether or not she's released will rest with the parole board, but I would have concerns about a woman this dangerous ever being released back into society. However, my closing thoughts are with Mark Van Dongen and his family. Mark was a young man who had his whole life ahead of him, but the last six years of his life were nothing but a nightmare. Five of these involved him being abused by a monster, and the last 15 months was, in my opinion, an experience I cannot even imagine. Unable to move, almost blind, disfigured and in pain every single day. At the age of just 29 years old, Mark's life was so horrific that he chose to die rather than living another moment like this. The pain that his father Keith must have felt, seeing his boy horrifically injured, sitting by his bedside for months, before eventually seeing his son take his last breaths, must have been nothing short of a nightmare. A parent should never have to bury their child, and they should never have to see their child in that amount of pain. The bravery of Mark holding on as long as he did, and Keith continuing on, is a testament to the bravery of these men as opposed to the cowardice of the demon that caused this. I've already said it, but I'll say it again. 
Mark, I hope you're at peace, free from pain. Keith, I hope you've been able to live some semblance of a life without your son. From what I've read, it's clear that the love you showed him was what gave him the strength to fight for as long as he did. And I've no doubt that you being there for his final journey meant everything to him. So, I'd love to know your thoughts about this horrific and tragic case. On another note, if you like my content, please like, share and subscribe. Also, if you want to become a channel member, click the join button. It's £2.99 a month, which is around $4. You get early access to videos and a nice VIP icon next to your name. Also, please consider sending a super thanks, which is a one-off donation. Both these things support me in what I do, because, as you can imagine, because of the nature of my videos, I'm unable to fully monetize almost all of them, so any support would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.